Commissioner Director Shaw. Still difficult to say Commissioner Director, but I believe I saw Commissioner Director Shaw. Uh, and uh, if you just want to say hello to everybody. Yeah, I just want to say hello. And I just real quick, last night we had a meeting um, and uh, something I think exciting for this group, we approved uh, via a state grant that's going to fund, if, if we get a word, the grant at our Votech school for a, uh, a new building that would be on the CCM campus that would focus on career and technical education programs, uh, specifically in healthcare and technology fields. The building would actually be on the CCM campus. So I think there's great synergy there. It's really exciting. And, and uh, this would turn out students uh, ready, ready to go to work in, in industry um, and technology fields in the county here. So very excited about that. Hope we do get the grant, 75% of the money about 18 million from the state and 6 million from the county. So that was some, some exciting news last night. That's a great uh, commissioner director. Uh, that's really uh, great news and fits in with a lot of the good things that, that seems are going on in the state right now. Uh, I will ask as we're doing this, uh, if you do have questions, you could put them in the chat and we'll, uh, we'll get through them uh, uh, as, uh, as we can. Uh, and uh, it'd be appropriate now to, to uh, say hello to, uh, Deputy uh, Morris County Commissioner uh, Deborah Smith, Deputy Director, I should say, to be uh, proper. Deputy Director Commissioner uh, Smith, are you here, Deborah? Yes. Yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, it's 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 a mouthful. Uh, definitely <laughs> switching to Commissioner. I'm also uh, Commissioner of our Insurance Commission, so that makes me a Commissioner squared. Uh, <laughs> I I just posted a little note to all of you that. Uh, last night, we introduced our 2021 budget. I'm also chair of the budget committee, along with uh, John Crickus and Kathy DiFilippo. And we introduced a 0% tax increase to existing taxpayers while providing for our infrastructure to make sure that we keep Morris County as beautiful it is, as it is, providing for our parks, providing for uh, the chamber and the economic development division as well as securing funds and making sure that we will continue to deal with the pandemic. I had heard yesterday that uh, the governor is hoping to expand the mega centers up to 4,000 vaccines a day, but that is obviously dependent upon receiving uh, the vaccines. Um, but we are close to 20, over 2,000 a day. So if the weather stays nice, we'll, we'll keep injecting everybody. So thank you. Good. Hopefully that that keeps going. And then, uh, speaking of uh, of County College, we have our, our leader of County College, who's always been been a great asset and uh, always uh, uh, collaborate uh, collaborating accessible. Uh, Tony Iacono, President Iacono. Thank Good you, afternoon. Alan. And uh, I, I want to start mine off uh, simply by saying thank you to Commissioner Shaw, and I see Commissioner. Smith is with us also. Uh, it's really exciting news that we're able to offer these kind of opportunities to people in Morris County. The great educations lead to great jobs and those students are the ones who stay here in Morris County and, and really help us make it a great place to live, work and play. And uh, a big thank you to Senator Bucco. He and his father uh, were instrumental in this. That legislation started with the Manufacturing Caucus and um, you know, true to how we all know them, they are always available and easy to work with and meet. It took a lot to get that legislation through, that funding through, um, but uh, but they believed what our commissioners believe and what we know to be true, which is it has a transformational impact, not only on people, but on community. So I'm, I am just deeply grateful to our commissioners and to the Senator and others who, who made that possible. We look forward to hopefully it stays on the right track and it all comes to fruition. But uh, all I can say is you've got the most grateful president in New Jersey this morning, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Tony. And I want to say um, hi and, and, and uh, here, here just a hello from Michael Eggington, head of government affairs for the New Jersey Chamber, who's worked closely with Chris Emmickholtz and Chrissy Buteas and, and JBIA and the Morris Chamber to help folks cope, uh, folks, corp companies uh, uh, cope with uh, COVID and, and try to uh, grow, even start new companies and, and hopefully keep their doors open. And uh, uh, it's been a great uh, collaboration. Uh, um, Michael, how are you? I'm good, Alan. There, there's nothing more to say. That was a great intro. So happy to be here and uh, look forward to uh, the great Senator Anthony Bucco's uh, remarks. So thank you everyone for allowing us to participate and uh, continue our help to uh, 
both your chamber and the other groups that Alan mentioned. Thank you. Fantastic. And I think uh, uh, Greg Stewart before, who I mentioned, uh, uh, councilman in Mount Olive and an active member of the uh, chamber. Uh, we're going to have uh, your Senator Orho next month. Uh, good, good afternoon. And, and welcome, everybody. And thanks. Uh, thanks for everybody for attending. Uh, Greg Stewart, I'm in Mount Olive. And uh, as I was pointed out, I'm also a member of uh, the Morris County Chamber, Mount Olive Chamber, as well as the uh, as um, the Hackett Sound Medical Center Board. But thanks for everything you guys are doing. That's fantastic. Thanks uh, for being here. And uh, Maria Farris, uh, who also is an elected official, a uh, councilwoman in Mount Arlington. I think we may have the mayor of Mount Arlington here too. And uh, tell us, uh, say hi and tell us about your business, uh, Maria. Absolutely. I'm happy to be here. Maria Farris, councilwoman in Mount Arlington. Uh, but I'm a business developer for AB Energy USC in USA. We work into the renewable energy with combined heat and power and RNG. Um, I guess I'm happy to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. And I see we have uh, former mayor, Deputy Mayor Grayzel from Morris Township, the great town of Morris Township. Uh, good afternoon, Jeff. How are you? Uh, good afternoon. I'm actually current mayor, um, Alan. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Forgive okay. me. That's okay. In the, town, in the Township Committee form of government, it gets a little confusing because every year it's somebody else. And it's I apologize. I didn't, it's hard track COVID, I didn't keep up, but congratulations. Yeah. That's okay. Half the time, everybody's a former mayor um, in a Township form of government. So mm -hmm. uh, it's okay. I'm happy to be here today. Thank you, Alan. And thank you to the Chamber for having these kinds of events. It's great to hear from my colleagues from around the country uh, as we all try to progress things to support our constituents. So um, thanks for having us. And Continue. Excellent. And uh, then we uh, have Jim Curtin. Good afternoon. Hi. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see so many familiar faces. I'm the uh, Chief Government and Business Relations Officer for Ascenda uh, Integrated Health, formerly uh, Daytop, New Jersey. Oh, great organization. And thank you uh, for being here. Uh, and Pat Dedeo, a good uh, friend and known community government expert and uh, welcome uh, Pat. Thanks Alan. Uh, Pat Tadeo, formerly with uh, William Patterson, uh, currently on the hunt and uh, also member uh, the uh, local commander of the flotilla on Lake Packer for the Coast Guard Auxiliary. Great. And we have uh, Marty Kane from Lake Packer. Good afternoon. Hey, good afternoon from a very frozen Lake Packer. We look forward to seeing you all up on the lake this spring and summer. Thank you. Thank you. And Carmen Deo, good afternoon. Uh, good morning, everyone. Carmine Deo from uh, Community Hope, Executive Director. Uh, glad to see everyone on and, and uh, you know, happy to uh, hear what uh, Senator Buka has to say. Good. And then we have uh, Bob Flynn, who uh, we've, the weather has been keeping busy recently uh, from uh, JCPNL. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Good to see all the familiar faces. Uh, Bob Flynn, JCPNL External Affairs from Mars County. Looking forward to being here and the Senator's comments, but thank you. Great. And uh, Larry Kasha, Counselor, good afternoon. I can't hear you, Larry. You need to unmute. Larry. Larry, you have to unmute. Unmuted. Okay, thank okay. you. Uh, appreciate the opportunity of being here and listening to the good Senator. Great, thank you. Uh, Elaine Winter, good afternoon. Can't hear you, Elaine. Oh, I had to unmute. Uh, good afternoon, Elaine Winter. I'm with um, Alzheimer's New Jersey, and I look forward to hearing uh, Senator uh, Buko's comments today. Thank you for all you do. Uh, welcome. Uh, and uh, Chris Coates. Can't hear you, Chris. Unmuting, sorry. Uh, yeah, Chris Coates, uh, SES ESOP Strategies. We advise small businesses on ESOPs as an avenue for business transition, and hopefully it'll be helpful in small business recovery. Much like Greg, I'm also involved in Atlantic Health. I'm on the Overlook Foundation Board, so looking forward to hearing uh, Senator Buco. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, Tom Phelan, always good to see you. Good afternoon. Unmute yourself and say hello. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Tom Phelan, BHX Engineering in Parsippany. It's good to see everybody. I look forward to seeing you all in person soon, I hope. Uh, but uh, I look forward to hearing uh, from uh, Senator Buco today as well. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Paul DeMeo, well, can you unmute yourself and say hello? 
Sure, thanks, Alan. Hi, I'm Paul DeMeo, Delta Dental of New Jersey, General Counsel, um, big supporters of the Senator. Look forward to uh, hopefully working with his office on some issues this year and, and hearing him speak today. Welcome and thanks for all uh, your support. Uh, and uh, Randy Stoddard, good afternoon. And uh, please say hello. Good afternoon, Randy Stoddard, Delta Dental Insurance, uh, Chief Marketing Officer. Uh, do a lot of work in our with our group out in the community and look forward to hearing Senator Buco. Thank you very much uh, for being here and again for all Delta Dental does for the community. Hunter Griffin, good afternoon. Good morning, yeah, Hunter Griffin from NJBIA along with Chris uh, and looking forward to hearing the Senator's comments, thank you. Great, and uh, Haskell Berman, always good to see you, uh, welcome. Thank you, Alan. Uh, hello, Senator. Uh, Haskell Berman, Senior Vice President, State Affairs with the Healthcare Institute of New Jersey, the State Trade Association for the research-based biopharmaceutical and medical technology companies, many of whom call Morris County home. home. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Haskell. Thanks for all you do. Josh Hurwitz, uh, I see if you can unmute yourself and say hello. Josh Hurwitz from Delta Dental. Great, nice to have, we have a lot of good representation from Delta Dental, that's great. Yes. Um, uh, Pat Robinson we have, uh, I don't know, she usually doesn't want to say hi, but she's a, a reporter with Jersey Hills uh, Media, the great weekly papers in the area. Do you want to say hello, Pat? I'll say hello, but then you okay. do this so well, I'm going to let you do it again, so keep, go <laughs> keep going. <laughs> Well, she, uh, she always respects that we like to keep the, uh, the comments private. Obviously, this is being streamed, so be aware of that. But unless you uh, say you're okay with it, she'll keep your own comments private, not mention your names, and I believe, uh, uh, and, and leaves that same discretion to Senator Bucco, who in the past has always been happy to, to be uh, quoted as are most of our, our guests, but we do leave that at their options so we could feel free to, uh, uh, feel free to talk uh, uh, more uh, openly uh, and have a more robust discussion. Uh, and welcome, Pat. Uh, uh, I see a Jeff Stadelman. Would you like to unmute and say hello? Yes, yeah, so Jeff Stadelman, the um, Mount Olive Economic Development Committee. And uh, we're plugging along out here uh, fine. And we're looking forward to your forum today. So thank you. Welcome. And uh, Allison Lorena. Good afternoon, uh, welcome, please say hello. Oh, hello everyone, I'm Allison Lorena. I'm the president and CEO of the Mayo Performing Arts Center. I'd like to thank you know many of you on this call today for all of your wonderful support of the theater and um, certainly Senator Bucco for, for his incredible support of MPAC as well. Well, uh, welcome and especially uh, groups like yours, we wish you well with COVID and all. We know it's difficult and we all wanna get back and uh, and be able to uh, enjoy the arts and, and especially let the artists uh, make a living. Uh, that's really important for the soul of our community and maybe less so for the soul. But today at four o'clock, I understand I'm able to buy devil's tickets for my household only at 10%. So uh, hopefully, and that's only for March. So uh, we'll see what happens in April and May and hopefully it just grows and continues with restaurants and, and everything. Uh, and with that, uh, I, I think you all know our, our speaker and are anxious to uh, to get to him. He's uh, uh, been a leader, obviously, following in the footsteps of his uh, father in the Assembly and the Senate. And he's a community attorney and has worked closely with the chamber uh, to try to open up uh, businesses and, and working with uh, the towns uh, in and around his uh, district and uh, as a leader uh, in the Senate. And uh, without any further ado, uh, please uh, join me in a, a virtual, warm, and robust uh, welcome for uh, Senator Tony Bucco. Thanks, Alan. I, I really appreciate um, these forums and the chamber and for everybody who is participating today. You know, this has been certainly been a trying year. And um, my work with the chamber uh, during this entire uh, process to help uh, businesses across the county and across the state um, has, uh, has, it couldn't have been more valuable to me than uh, what the chamber provided me and uh, the insight uh, to be able to help folks, uh, like I said, not only around the county, but around the state and, and, and actually put the chamber on the map uh, from the very beginning of the pandemic. So, um, so I applaud the chamber ELC 
and all of you for the hard work that um, you've put in uh, during these very, very difficult times. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the top line issues in Trenton. Uh, Chris already spoke about the budget, talk a little bit about the marijuana legislation um, and some of the other things that are happening down in Trenton and give everybody an opportunity to uh, ask some questions and, and have some dialogue because uh, as much as uh, elected officials love to speak, um, you know, I like to hear a little bit of what everybody has to say because um, that helps me in, uh, in how I represent you in Trenton when I hear about how uh, things are impacting you, that gives me the ability to take that down the trend and convey th those sentiments. Um, so let's talk about the budget. Chris is correct. Um, the budget this year is about $45 billion. It's an increase of about 4.5 billion, 11% um, over last year, 30% uh, overall uh, during Governor Murphy's term. Chris is absolutely correct. This is unsustainable. Um, and the fact that um, we had this kind of surplus and that the revenues were under projected as many of us in my caucus and the Republican caucus uh, were saying from the very beginning um, just confirms the fact that there was no need this year to borrow $4.5 billion. Uh, we said that back when the legislation passed. Um, I spoke about it on the floor and, um, and now we see exactly what many of us said uh, come to fruition. Uh, this was uh, a budget being built on an election year. And, um, and it's unfortunate because if there was any uh, ever a time to really make good use of the money and to spend the money when, uh, when you had it, uh, this was the year, you know, we've been, I've been pounding the table to get more money into our small businesses into our hospitality industry, into the arts, uh, all of those, all of those industries are suffering, and um, we kept kept hearing how the state was in such dire straits. When in fact now, um, you know there are uh, billions of dollars that are going to be spent um, for a whole host of different things that uh, could have been could have been used a lot sooner and put into places where they really could have made a difference. Uh, earlier on. And, and the fact that, you know, we're all hearing that uh, the state's going to get another six billion, uh, up to six billion from the federal government, um, just really makes it hard uh, to sit here and look at this budget and, and be happy about it. Um, you know, there is good news, there's no new taxes. But um, let me tell you, with the amount of money that's out there, uh, there's no need to have any additional taxes. Uh, it would been it would have been absolutely crazy. Uh, for the governor to include um, uh, tax hikes uh, with the type of revenue that he has at his disposal this year. School funding is up about 587 million, although uh, many of the larger districts, uh, school districts in my legislative district uh, are still losing money, which is unacceptable. Um, there's $380 million uh, to give everybody a $500 rebate in July. Um, you know, what's that, where is that coming from? And, and, you know, there's so many better ways to spend, to spend that money and $200 million, uh, for offshore wind projects. However, there's no money in this budget for Lake Apacon. I see Marty Kane, uh, on the line. Um, you know, no money for Lake Apacon. You know, this is the state's lake. It's one of the uh, so it is the largest lake, uh, state-owned lake in the state. And, um, you know, the, this budget with the amount of money that we're spending doesn't continue the commitment uh, to the folks um, in the Lake Apacon area and, and to all the people that use the lake for recreational purposes. That's something that um, uh, I will be banging the drum on. You can just about guarantee um, in the coming months as we work towards the budget process. So, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of money being spent. If you're on the receiving end, you're going to be lucky. But, um, you know, come next year, you better hold on to your wallets. That's just my projection unless, you know, this money comes in from the federal government because uh, this type of pace of spending 
is just unsustainable without major, major, major uh, tax increases to continue spending at, this, at these rates. The other thing I wanted to take a minute to talk about is the marijuana legislation. You all know that um, back in November, there was a constitutional amendment on the ballot to legalize uh, the recreational use of marijuana. Uh, that passed. Um, I said from the very beginning that this process was backwards. And, um, you know, you don't put a constitutional amendment on the ballot and then come back and try to put the legislation together to authorize it. Um, and that's what has caused um, the fight and missteps down in Trenton, trying to figure out exactly where the revenue was going to be spent, uh, how the recreational marijuana was going to be rolled out in terms of uh, the marketplace and, um, and, and the whole social justice issues. The, um, the legislation that was finally passed um, on Monday um, is very troubling to me. Uh, you know, uh, the legal age for recreational use will be 21 years of age. But if, but if you are between 18 and 21, and you are found to be in possession of marijuana, you're gonna be treated one way. If you're under 18, you're gonna be treated another way. And in fact, if you're under 18 and caught with marijuana or alcohol, there are going, it, it's less of an offense than if you're between 18 and 21. And, and the legislation ties the hands of our law enforcement officers uh, and agencies from even uh, asking questions or um, obtaining search warrants or doing anything if a person is a minor and is caught with, uh, with, caught with marijuana. And to me, I, that's, um, I, I just think it's a big mistake. It sends the wrong message to our young folks it tells them to go ahead and go out there and use recreational marijuana, go ahead and get out there and, you know, consume alcohol and the police will be powerless to do anything if you're stopped and they can't even notify your parents if you're stopped on the first offense, which makes absolutely no sense to me. Um, you know, think about what this is going to do to our public areas and our beaches this year, and think about Lake Apacon. Um, kids are going to be able to go up there, uh, you know, drink, smoke, and uh, if a police officer arrives, all they can do is is uh, is confiscate the uh, you know the the substance and um, and give them a warning. They can't even notify their parents. They can't um, go into a car to see if there's you know uh, more marijuana in the car. Uh, you know, think about house parties in your hometowns. If a police officer, if a complaint comes in, a police officer rolls up and they're underage drinking and there's underage smoking going on in that house, the police officer is going to be powerless to go inside. If somebody opens the door and they're underage and they have a beer in their hand, the officer can take the beer, but that's about as far as they're going to be able to go. Makes absolutely no sense. I think we are setting this up for a disaster, it is going to encourage drug dealers to um, utilize minors uh, to, to sell and distribute um, drugs because, you know, the police are going to be powerless to, uh, to do anything other than confiscate what they see. And, um, and uh, I think that that is a, a big problem. In terms of employers, if you're an employer, uh, you will be able to uh, require drug testing, but um, it'll be very difficult you, for you to fire somebody based on a failure of a drug test uh, for marijuana. Um, you're going to have to uh, retain what they call workplace impairment um, uh, experts, and um, they can either be hired from the outside, but uh, or you can train somebody within your with your own uh, corporation or company uh, to get the training to become one of these experts. But the fact is those regulations haven't even been proposed yet. Um, you know, these are all still things 
that will have to come in terms of um, in terms of the commission that's been established to develop all these rules and regulations for recreational use. And I, you know, Jimmy Curtin's on the on the line. Nobody can tell you better about uh, the impacts of uh, marijuana, not only in the workplace but for our young folks, uh, than Jim Curtin. He has uh, seen it all, and um, you know, and, and employers are going to be prohibited from uh, refusing to hire someone if, in fact, uh, they know that they are um, a recreational marijuana user. So, um, you know, I think this this process um, that we went through with this, this the people that went to the polls in November, I guarantee you that supported this. This is not the law that they envisioned that that they would get as a result of their support for recreational uh, marijuana use in the state of New Jersey. And this is going to be uh, troubling going forward. Uh, there's no question about it. The, um, the law enforcement agencies and leaders in law enforcement have already uh, said that, you know, if, if, if you see one of these things and you call 911, uh, you know, they're, they're not common because uh, they are going to be subjected to civil rights violations um, if, uh, if, they, uh, if, if, if they're not careful in how they handle a minor uh, with uh, either uh, marijuana or, or alcohol now. Um, we also have introduced some legislation. Uh, it's going to be bipartisan legislation that's been introduced to um, take $300 million um, and put it towards small businesses and nonprofits uh, in the EDA. Um, this is long overdue. Uh, the governor previously had vetoed um, money that we set aside for, um, for the hospitality industry. So um, we know that uh, the EDA is underfunded when it comes to small businesses and not-for-profits like the Mayo Performing Arts Center and, and other uh, facilities that have been devastated as a result of the shutdown. Uh, this $300 million bipartisan bill, we are going to push very hard uh, to get it passed so that uh, the EDA will have uh, the resources necessary uh, to help uh, our struggling economy. And, um, you know, we're hopeful that uh, that that will be able to, um, to kind of stem the tide of uh, the closures that we've seen. One third of of all businesses uh, have closed their doors forever. And um, it's time that we, we work really hard to make sure that we're able to save what we have left. Uh, you may have saw that uh, we are planning to hold special hearings. Um, we had originally asked uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to join us. Um, to conduct uh, special legislative hearings to look at what went wrong in the long-term care facilities, um, the missteps at uh, the Department of Labor to get your unemployment benefits, uh, motor vehicle missteps in, uh, in the reopening process and the impacts uh, on our economy around the state. Uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle did not wanna go down that road so uh, the Republican senators uh, have asked our assembly colleagues on the other side of the on, on, in the assembly to join us, and we are going to begin uh, in early March uh, special hearings to address each one of these subjects. These are not hearings to to have a gotcha moment. Um, you know, these are hearings to look at what went wrong and how we can make sure that it never happens again. And it's something that we need to have because, um, you know, I kept I keep hearing from the governor that he wants to do post mortem analysis. Well, we can't wait for this pandemic to be over um, until we start addressing some of the issues that have been out there for so long. I mean, it has been a year, and my office is still getting four, five, ten calls a day on unemployment issues that people can't get their benefits. These are two, three, four months old motor vehicle commission uh, problems that people can't get appointments. 
um, you know, long-term care facilities that can't get the vaccination, the vaccination rollout, um, all of these things need to be looked at and adjusted so that we can make the changes now, not when the pandemic is over. Because let me tell you, we all know what happens when uh, the pandemic is over. People are just going to want to get back to normal. And um, we will all have short memories about what happened in the past. So it, it's time for us to take a look at those things. And uh, I look forward to those hearings commencing. I will serve on the committee that will look at uh, the impact on businesses uh, around the state. And finally, uh, with all the money that's in this budget, um, I have pushed very hard to have uh, a substantial amount of money dedicated to upgrading uh, the state's computer systems. Um, every, every, um, every step that the state makes, um, every, every system that has to be operated within the agencies, whether it's unemployment in the Department of Labor, motor vehicles, the vaccine uh, rollout, the Department of Health, every one of these agencies, the computer systems are so antiquated that um, it's impossible to interface them uh, with anything else. And it's impossible to get even programmers uh, to come in and program them to address this situation. And, um, you know, the governor has put a small amount of money into this budget. I think he put $7 million to the Department of Labor to increase their, uh, to, to upgrade their systems. When in fact, uh, the commissioner and the department have said it's gonna take 200 million just for that department alone. If we're gonna have all of this extra money this year, if we have all this money to spend, um, we need to dedicate a substantial amount of money to upgrade this computer, these computer systems. Because if we don't, um, we will never get out of this, out of this problem. We need, you know, we're working on systems that were developed uh, back during the Apollo era. And, um, and while they may have been useful for, for putting a man on the moon, uh, today uh, they are killing us in being able to deliver services to, to our residents. So um, I had an editorial on the Star Ledger, I think last weekend on it. Uh, I've issued a couple of press releases with regard to it. And I've been interviewed a number of times uh, by uh, some of the major networks about uh, this situation, and I am going to continue to advocate for additional funds to go into the state, to go into up, upgrading the state's computer systems. I think that it's critical um, in, uh, in, in solving some of these problems and moving the state forward. We can't move forward on these antiquated systems. So that being said, uh, I've probably spoken well longer than, um, than I should have. So i um, I'll, uh, I'll take any questions that anybody might have. Thank you, uh, Senator. You are bringing up uh, important issues and I uh, think it's uh, important to get this information out. A lot is happening quickly and I'll turn it over to Mike Stanzillis who has been skillfully distilling these questions and prioritizing them to ask, uh, uh, I'm sure a, a very important and thought provoking question, Mike. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. So thank you, Senator, for, for speaking today. Uh, we've got the first question here uh, in the chat. And, uh, and feel free, uh, after he answers a question, you can type it in, in the chat, or you can just unmute yourself and, and blurt it out. We'll figure out who's speaking. Uh, this is an open conversation. The Senator is very nimble in answering these questions. First question is, what is your favorite color? Yeah. And, 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 and that comes from Greg Stewart of Mount Olive. Blue. <laughs> Flu. Okay, great. Wrong, wrong answer. Um, so here we go. So all things, uh, all kidding aside, are there areas of focus to not only help the businesses, but also keep them in state? No tax increase helps, but the ones that survive need to stay in the state. Any programs related to retention and ideally attracting businesses? And that comes from Christopher Coates. Um, that's a great question. And obviously affordability is uh, the number one issue. So, um, you know, we need to work on that. Certainly, we're happy that there are no tax increases this year, um, but people need to feel comfortable that um, that's gonna be the status quo 
and um, and 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 not the uh, you know not the outlier. Um, so affordability is certainly a big issue. And yes, you know, I in my own opinion, and and you're all out there, you're probably seeing this. I think the economy um, is going to change as a result of COVID. Many companies are looking at the space that they currently have and deciding whether or not they need that much space. Um, you know, will more people be working from home? You know, will um, the economy shift? This morning, I uh, was a panelist and participated in the NJ uh, MEP uh, manufacturing um, uh, manufacturing. Um, uh, State, the state of the state. Yeah, state of the state of manufacturing. And, you know, we spoke about the changes in, um, you know, manufacturing and the fact that, um, you know, Mars County was kind of ahead of the curve in this in developing programs and having the county um, actually dedicate an entire facility to this process, to training our young folks uh, for these new emerging jobs uh, in uh, high tech manufacturing where, you know, there are great salaries and, um, and, and great opportunities for advancement. So um, we do need to do that. We also need to make sure that um, those companies that still need support coming out of COVID are able to get it, um, whether it's in the hospitality industry, restaurant industry, um, you know, the arts, um, you know, in all of those places, we need to make sure that um, we have the money necessary to support them to get us uh, over the finish line till the economy gets back, uh, back operating again. So um, the other good news, I guess, is that in this budget for the first time, we're seeing an actual increase in, um, in transportation spending, which means that our roads and bridges and, um, you know, Nork Penn Station and, um, and, and part of the gateway project uh, are all gonna, gonna begin to get funded, um, not only by state money, but by federal money, so that um, people's ability to get from one place to another uh, will be uh, improved and manufacturers and people that will need to get goods and services around the state will have the ability to do that. So, um, so, so yes, the state is looking at this. It is a major priority, and we need to make sure that um, you know folks uh, have um, confidence in the state that uh, the state's going to do the right thing going forward. You know, uh, our, my friends from the state chamber are on NJBIA. Uh, you know, um, I they are great advocates for the business community at the state house, and um, you know they've they've provided a great resource to me to be able to come up with some of the legislation that's been introduced and, uh, and support the things that are necessary to keep the state moving forward. Great, thank you. Next question is from Elaine Winter and she wants to know what's happening with Sally's Law. They are, uh, she is advocating for support on this bill. Uh, just a quick, uh, what is Sally's Law? It establishes testing and visitation requirements and employment restrictions for long-term care facilities in response to outbreaks of infectious disease. Yeah, um, really critical, critical piece of legislation. It is moving forward, my understanding, um, and uh, been. I think it's already through the Senate, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we've gone through a bunch of. Uh, uh, we, we, we've had a bunch of um, voting sessions, and uh, I, I think we put it through already. But it is moving, and um, I anticipate and hope that it will uh, that it will get to the governor's desk. Great, thank you. This is a uh, great question from Greg Stewart, and it's on pretty much every elected official's mind in the county. And so, what are the steps uh, we are doing to counter the under sixteen limitations for police departments in Morris County for ca uh, cannabis? Are you going to coordinate with all the towns uh, to raise objections to this issue? Um, actually, um, Assemblyman Bramnick, the minority leader in the, in the assembly, um, and I are working on legislation right now to address some of the issues uh, relating to that. 
So um, not only are we sounding the alarm, but we've already started to put together legislation that, um, that would address some of this stuff. One of the things that the legislation will address is notification to the parents. You know, I think it's critical that uh, parents be notified if their uh, minor child is picked up with alcohol or, or drugs. You know, to, to just say, to, to tell a 14 year old that if, if they're caught smoking marijuana, that your parents aren't gonna be told, you might as well light the joint and hand it to them. Um, it, it just makes absolutely no sense. Uh, you know, there's, there'll be no consequence, no parental notification, and we need to change that because uh, parents have a right to know uh, if their child uh, is uh, is caught with these substances, and um, and and it, it, it's only good for the child as well. I mean, you know, we've seen so many times that uh, you know if these problems go unaddressed for for too long, that they turn into bigger problems. Uh, and um, you know, my my time with Daytop. Uh, prove that over and over and over again. So um, the earlier the intervention, the better it is. Great, thank you. Let's stick with the cannabis discussion real briefly here. Um, this is as we are on a business call with a lot of businesses here, we're business associations. Um, safety in the workplace is a huge issue with cannabis. Um, is there an effort to do any amendments to the legislation? Like uh, there, currently there's 15 states where cannabis is legal, nine of them have special carve outs for safety sensitive positions. Uh, let's say for example, there's a post accident uh, drug and alcohol test, the person tests positive for cannabis, they could say I was smoking it legally three days ago on the weekend and today I was driving your kids to school and got into an accident. There's no way to know what happened. So uh, are there any efforts to uh, do amendments to this for <clears throat> safety in the workplace? Yes. And al along with that, the liability issues that would come with that. Yes, um, you know, even uh, Senator Sarlo the other day on the floor um, was very vocal about his displeasure on the way that this legislation got rolled out. But again, it, 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 it's a product of doing it backwards, right? Instead of the legislature, you know, crafting the legislation and, and you know, preparing uh, the outline for how this was going to work, and then passing that in order to get to the next step of recreational marijuana. Instead, because they couldn't get the votes to do that from the beginning, um, they kind of skirted that issue and you know, made, made it legal by a simple yes or no vote uh, without any details. And, um, and that was just the wrong way to go about doing this. And today, the state of New Jersey is paying the price for that because we're now coming back and rushing through legislation because um, our law enforcement and prosecutors' hands were so tied um, by the constitutional amendment that in January made it legal, but we had no mechanism to, to, to roll out the legalization uh, and recreational use of, of cannabis. And, um, you know, it, it was definitely a product of, of a backwards of rollout of this policy change, and um, and and we're again we're paying the price for it. Yeah, and Senator Bucco, just building on a little bit, is one hundred percent right. Um, BIA every step of the way has tried to squeeze that amendment in. We've been pushing for exemptions for those safety sensitive businesses, the nuclear power plants, chemical plants, uh, utility workers, um, truck drivers, you name it a lot of folks where you need to have more of a focus on the drug-free workplace. Other states do it more than us. And we were, even even with the Republicans supporting us, um, pro-business Democrats supporting us, like Senator Sarlow, chairman of the budget committee, when it got out of his committee, he actually had this in it. And then they uh, changed it in the Judiciary Committee back to the way it is right now. But uh, we were just told that basically they want to err on the side of protecting the rights of people to smoke, dr smoke a drug that's now legal rather than the rights of employers to make sure their, their workplace is drug-free. I don't agree with that. And I, I know that there's um, the majority of Republicans didn't agree with that and they were very helpful every step of the way, but um, it unfortunately is the way it is. Great, thanks. Thanks, Chris. 
My, uh, Mike Eggington, did you want to say something? And Jim Curtin, I think you wanted to say something. Go ahead, Jim first, Mike second. Yep. Yes, thanks. Hello, Senator. Uh, that's uh, following up on uh, Chris's point about uh, cleanup bills, further cleanup bills for employer protections, and to address some of these uh, really major concerns with the underage problem here. I mean, if I'm a parent in, in a community and so much has been focused on police and being good partners in the community, and I find out the local policeman or the local police force found my child with marijuana and didn't notify me, the parent, knowing what we know that, you know, people who use marijuana underage are much more likely to grow up with a diagnosable substance use disorder. I mean, that's, that's just data. But I'm, as a parent, if a, if a police officer doesn't notify me, I really feel that's a dereliction of duty. And, um, and also, and I realize I get the way the bill is now and the law is passed that- um, you, If they notify you, if they notify the parent, um, you know, against uh, the law as it's written, uh, they'll subject themselves yeah. to uh, that um, that this law could get through the legislature, and it got through by, believe me, just you know, uh, a couple of votes to spare. But um, you know, it it it's creating it will it will create, and you'll see it in the coming months. It will create a problem not only for the business community but it'll create a major problem uh, for our communities in general when the kids recognize that they can do this and get away with it without any type of, uh, of consequence. Yeah. In, 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 do you think you have enough support among your colleagues in, you know, in, in getting some of these cleanup bills passed going forward to address some of the concerns we're talking about here this afternoon? You know, I think as parents begin to realize what this law says, and as uh, more and more employers have to grapple with, uh, you know, the craziness of this legislation, yes, I think that the pressure is going to be put on enough legislators uh, to for them to say, hey, we got to do something about this. And that's what we're hoping for. You know, we're hoping that, um, you know, the parents uh, of, of these, you know, youngsters now um, are going to say, hey, wait a minute, you know, I want to know if my, if my child's been picked up with alcohol or drugs, you know, I don't want to have to, you know, to, to be kept in the dark until a second or third offense. Thank you, Senator. We're up against time. Michael eggington has been patiently waiting. Mike, you'll be the last question, and then we'll hand it back to Alan and Megan to quickly close us out. Uh, Mike? Yeah, thank you, Mike, Alan, Megan. Um, more of a comment than a question because the Senator and I work very closely together. I just wanted to point out to this group, as you heard in the last hour, that we have a great pro-business uh, Senator here with us, Senator Bucco. His father was the same way. They were both recipients of our Legislator of the Year Award most recently. Uh, Senator Bucco uh, uh, received that recognition from us. So I wanted to point it out, you know, it's something that we do every other year and you know we have a high litmus test and I know my friend and colleague Chris Hemingholtz you know uh, agrees. I also want to extend my condolences uh, Senator to the loss of Senator Cardinale who back in the Whitman administration I used to nickname him the father of tort reform. Uh, he did a big tort reform package and you know if we didn't do it back then you can imagine where we would be with strict and joint and several liability issues and, and the like even though we have other problems now, um, another great legislator. So just a comment and uh, a, a world of thanks and continue to work with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And thanks to the state chamber for all the great work you do. So uh, thank you, Senator Bucco. I know we're running out of time, so I'll hand it back to Alan and Megan to close this out. Okay, uh, Mike, thank you, and, and, and thank you, uh, Senator. Let's give a, a warm virtual welcome to the uh, Senator of Appreciation uh, for his, uh, his help, uh, and uh, very much appreciated, and also for our, uh, our two uh, commissioners that we had on and our, uh, our mayors, or our committee people, and all the, the business folks that were here. Uh, remember, March 24th at 1230, we have Senator Oraho, and we also have uh, the governor appointed uh, someone from one of his executive orders. Jane Cohen is is going to be head or is now head of the Office of Climate Action and the Green Economy. So we're uh, um, interested to know how that will affect 
businesses in New Jersey uh, for better and for for worse, how how that will uh, affect things and uh, uh, moving forward and uh, something to be aware of. So uh, she's agreed to speak sometime in May. So look for that. And there's also some initiatives regarding uh, red tape or regulation. So we're going to try to put somebody together on that. So we have a lot of exciting things coming up. Uh, there's uh, wind power and, and the effects of that. So uh, lots, of, lots of things to stay tuned for. And with that, I will uh, thank everyone one last thank time. Thank Kelcon, Josh Benson, our, our steadfast supporter and sponsor Absolutely. of the Government Absolutely. Affairs Committee. Absolutely. And thank you to all of you. Uh, you guys, are, we're so happy that you're here today. And uh, we'll see you next month. Thank you very much.